Okay, so, hello everyone. My name is Iran. I'm the non-official PTL for Stolets. Uh, non-official because it's not yet an official project. Um, with me is um, Yosef Moati from IBM. And this work represents uh, both use cases and work that we've done with GridPocket, whose CEO, Philip, um, could not make it. GridPocket is a company that does personal smart grid solutions. Um, and this talk is about uh, what type of use cases can we do with um, OpenStack storlets. So, first of all, what are storlets all about? Storlets are about collocating storage and compute. What does it mean to collocate storage and compute? It means that if you have a lot of data you need to process, then instead of copying the data over from the storage cluster to the compute cluster, you basically put the compute near the storage and you don't have to move any data. You bring the compute to the data. But more specifically, storlets are about uh, collocating dockerized computations inside OpenStack Swift nodes uh, in a serverless fashion. So I've said three things. I've said Swift, I've said dockerized computations, and I've said serverless fashion. So let's talk a little bit about each of them. So Swift is a massively scalable object storage system that takes care of um, data redundancy through, for example, replication across failure domains. At its base, it has a very, very basic um, API of put a data blob or get a data blob. So it's very simple, but on the other hand, it is massively scalable, both in terms of um, the capacity of the data that, can it hold, that it can hold, as well as the number of user, concurrent users that can access the data. Docker, well, I don't need to explain what Docker is. The reason we're using Docker is so that the compute that runs inside the storage system is more, is, it is done more securely and isolated because after all, we need to uh, make sure that the storage system continues to work. What do I mean by serverless fashion? The idea here is that the end user bring his own computer program and uploads it to Swift as if it was a regular object, and we take care of the rest without the user needing to do any server-side um, configurations or whatever. So basically, this is what we're, what we're doing. We're allowing to do Dockerized compute within OpenStack Swift. What is it good for? So one thing it is good for is big data. What happens when the big data gets big? And what does that mean? It means that the big data does not longer fit into the expensive primary storage. And so what we do, we move it to a secondary storage. Don't get confused, the data didn't shrink, it's the object store, it's the, object, it's the storage system that grew larger. But when we move the data to a secondary storage, it doesn't mean that we no longer want to produce information out of it. We still want to query, to query that data, and we want to do this efficiently. So by efficiently, we mean that we don't need to copy the data back to the primary storage in order to do something. So um, in case you, you're confused here, the boat is going from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. And storage can give us just that. We can put the compute where the big data is. Um, We'll now move to a concrete example um, of this use case given by Yosef from IBM. Hi, so in the next uh, 10 minutes, uh, we will discuss uh, Great Pockets use case. So we will see the problem or solution, solution performance measurements, both in terms of test beds and results. And then finally, we have a short uh, demo. So what's the problem? The problem is data ingest. GridPocket is a smart energy grid company. Its platform supports uh, for up to millions of smart meters, and these meters produce 10 of terabytes of CSV data per year. Now, how do we uh, uh, analyze all this data? The infrastructure is composed of a Spark compute cluster, and uh, a Swift object store, which are disaggregated uh, clusters. So now the problem is that for each SQL query that you run, you have to ingest terabytes of data. What could we do for that? Could we cache the data? Very good idea. The problem is that in general, you don't have the necessary terabytes of memory, so you can't do that. Could we index the data? Also a good idea. But uh, the problem is that data scientists evolve 
uh, there are SQL queries so that you can't, you just can't do it. So uh, what happens is that when uh, your infrastructure grows, both in terms of Swift cluster and Spark cluster, then what happens is that you have to grow and to grow your network. And, um, and this is a problem. So what's our solution? Our solution is to bring to Swift, to the Swift object store, part of the traditional database smartness. And this more specifically, the, the user defined functions. What does it give? It gives a possibility for the user to run at the data side uh, code that he wrote. Specifically in our case, we want to filter out unwanted data and want to, we want to be, this to be done at the data side, not after bringing this to, this to the cluster, to the Spark or whatever compute side. So here is our solution. We bring to the Swift side uh, the ability to filter out the, the, the data by writing, that's what we did, uh, a storage which just is, filters the CSV data out uh, according to, to what, whatever we, we want. And this is passed as parameters. So uh, uh, obviously we also had to modify the, the Spark side and we did that by extending the CSV the Spark CSV library, so that we now implemented the necessary APIs which permit to push down the filter to the object, to, to the Swift side. Uh, now we will present <coughs> experiments which we did at OSIC. OSIC is the OpenStack Innovation Center. Uh, we had a large and uh, very strong uh, cluster uh, composed of, the, we had a, st a strong Spark uh, cluster, a strong Swift cluster. They were linked through uh, the load balancer, which was at uh, um, 10 gigabits per second. And very quickly we saw that we had, uh, as uh, we explained previously, we, we, we experienced a bottleneck uh, at the connection between the two clusters. So uh, uh, before uh, we present the results of uh, our experiments, uh, what, uh, what readings did we use? We, we used real uh, obfuscated data, which were composed out of 10 columns and uh, each uh, row was about 100, 100 car characters. The, we used two kinds of queries. We used real uh, industrial queries of a, of a, a grid pocket. All, and we also used synthetic queries which, were, which we composed in order to target given selectivity. Uh, the query focused is on ingest, that is the, the ingesting the data from the data uh, store, to, from the object store to the, to the Spark uh, side. And uh, therefore, uh, we do not present results for, uh, for uh, queries which, which have long post-processing. For instance, you could, uh, you could run machine learning uh, at the Spark side, which, which connects to SQL, brings the data, does some uh, uh, SQL processing, and then use that for one hour of uh, machine learning computation. Uh, the, the, we don't, uh, this is not uh, our focus, so we used, uh, 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 and we, uh, we used the queries which were uh, with uh, small post-processing. Here is, uh, is a, a grid pocket uh, uh, query, where you can see uh, the, in the where, you can see that this is a row uh, selection, and you can see also the column projection with date and index index, which means that two columns will be used out of the 10 columns of the data. So what did we measure before we present the results? We measured mainly two things. First one is the speed up. How long does it take to run a, an SQL query without pushdown 
versus with pushdown, what's the ratio? And also in terms of utilized resources. Okay, so this first chart shows that for three terabytes, that's the leftmost uh, column, it takes a, no less than more than one hour just to run a simple SQL query. It means you have to, to wait for one hour. This is unacceptable in terms of uh, data scientists which expect uh, to, to, to analyze the data. By the way, all the plots presented uh, belong to research work and uh, submission. Now, what, uh, what, um, what speed up did we experience? For half of a terabyte, we experienced a, a more than, if we are at 90% uh, data selection, we see that we have more than, than uh, 10, 10 X uh, speed up. If we move to three terabytes, uh, then we have even, an, even a bit more, a bit better uh, speed up. And the in important point is to notice that in a real world, this is, uh, the selectivity is typically higher than 80%. So we are, uh, all work permits to really uh, improve tremendously, uh, uh, to give a, a very big speed up for real world uh, uh, queries. Uh, this chart shows for, uh, for queries which, uh, which gave the selectivity of even close to 99%, even more than 99%, we can show, we can see that the speed up went up to even 30 or even more than 30. I will skip uh, this, this uh, chart for lack of time. Um, now, resource consumption. Uh, at the Spark side, no, no big difference in mean uh, memory used. In terms of uh, CPU used, uh, when you don't have push down, you use uh, in the, on the average more than twice the, the average, the, the CPU that is used with push down. Uh, average bandwidth is three times higher. Uh, I forgot, by the way, to mention that all these numbers uh, pertain to a specific query uh, against a three terabyte data set at selectivity of 99% uh, and uh, for which we experience a speed up of 20. So the, the average bandwidth is three times higher without push down. Uh, at the Swift side, no big difference in terms of memory. However, CPU is much more used uh, when, uh, on the average, when using uh, push down, this is clear because we are running at uh, this uh, at, at this uh, at the Swift side. We are running solid, so it takes a CPU. Now, what is important to to notice uh, and to remember is that the query duration is 20 times 20 times uh, longer without push down. So that when we say, for instance, that we have an average bandwidth which is three times higher without push down, it's not only three times higher on the average, it's also for 20 times uh, mm -hmm. more, 20, 20 more times. So th that's, that's a very big difference. Uh, now we move to, to the demo, uh, which is a recorded demo. Uh, we had the, this nice test bed for three weeks. Uh, after that, we, we came back to our <laughs> original test bed, which was a, a, a bit uh, different. So uh, the demo is, is, has been recorded for uh, a, a small test bed with three low-end uh, Spark machines and three low-end uh, Swift object nodes. We also addressed a small uh, data set. This is because uh, we had to, 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 to show this uh, in quite uh, uh, swiftly. And uh, also the speed up, because all of this setup, the speed up uh, is also quite modest, three to four, which is nice, but uh, that's, that's not the 30 that we saw. And also uh, what, what we will see in this demo is in fact a comparison of running a series of queries without and with push down. So I'll play it and you'll talk. <laughs>
too. So what we see at uh, the upper hand is uh, the loading of Swift, uh, Swift uh, data sets. And then uh, we have a series of, uh, uh, a series of queries, which uh, after they are, they are first run with pushdown and the time it takes is, uh, is, um, is uh, printed after each query completes. And then, uh, then the, the grid pocket guys uh, use the results to, to the, for graphic demonstration, as you can see. So here you see that it took 20 seconds, and this is in real time. Uh, uh, however, when we will move to the no pushdown, we shorten the, the times because we don't have, uh, it takes, uh, it takes long. So here we progress with all the queries. 21 seconds for this one. Perhaps we need to mention that this, this was done by the Grid Pocket team, um, this recording. And, the, and of course, the queries in the IPython notebook on which it's running. Yeah, I forgot to, yeah, to mention Jupyter. Now we're almost done. And now, Now the, we, we, we rerun the, the queries without push down, and now this is accelerated. This is not real time. And finally, if you can stop here, thank you. Finally, here is the interesting part, is uh, it gives you uh, how, in fact, we, we run twice without push down, twice with push down, and you see the time comparison for each of the queries. Uh, so. That, that, that gives you uh, the speed up about uh, three. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so this was the big data related um, use case. I'll now move to the next use case, which is, um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, this is all in the open. So from the Stolitz uh, side of things, this is part of the OpenStack Stolitz repository, and from the um, Spark side of things, there is this repo there. Um, the test the code, the test the readme with how to set it up and test it and so on and so forth. Okay, so the next use case is data presentation. Presentation. privacy. Thank you. So it's data privacy, not data piracy. So the idea here is that we're holding a sensitive piece of data in the object store. However, we may benefit from sharing this data once it's obfuscated. So perhaps sharing with pirates isn't exactly beneficial, however, in other cases it is, such as in another use case we have from Grid Pocket. So, smart meters are here. Um, as evidence from this uh, quote, there are over 60 million smart meters uh, deployed by end of uh, 2015, and it's only part of the deployment. And they're not only here, they're also produced data. So, it comes to, uh, with like, Small resolution collection, we can get to 10 terabytes uh, of data per year, and if there is higher resolution, it can get to tens of petabytes. However, this data is highly sensitive, as evident from this graph here. So actually, just looking at the data, one can tell whether a refrigerator is turned on or an oven element turned on, and actually, Philip once told us that with a high enough resolution, one can tell which channel is being watched on TV. So definitely, this is sensitive. And this is also made um, clear by this um, White House report, which says that smart meters can turn homes into transparent fish tanks, completely penetratable to marketers, police, and criminals. And as you know, in, the, in, in Europe, data sensitivity is something important, and it is expected that um, at the year 2018, there are going to be regulations that are going to impact um, energy services providers that will have to um, make sure the data is safe. 
So how can Storlets help here? Here is what we can do. Oh, sorry, most important. So on one hand, there's a lot of data. On the other hand, it's sensitive. However, sharing it might be beneficial, as I've mentioned before. So it either may be beneficial from the um, sharing it with the provider that can um, just improve the service if he has the data. Alternatively, if we give it the data to a, um, a third party that does um, the trans efficiency tool on that, we may save money. It can help, it can recommend to us how we can um, consume electricity in a smarter way. So on one hand, it is sensitive. On the other hand, it might be beneficial to share it. So what can we do? We can use toilets to obfuscate the data so that the utility company, for example, doesn't get the raw data, but rather an average or some low-pass filter that makes it less sensitive. Um, so this way, if the data owner on the left-hand side allows to access only via storage, then the utility user wouldn't be able to get the data as is, but it would be able to get it obfuscated via storage. So we're gonna demonstrate that. What the demo would show is that the data owner can give access via story to a user, and that the user cannot access the data um, before it is given access and only get access via storlets. The demo is going to use Firefox Stress plugin. Uh, we're gonna use the same Firefox instance to drive both the data owner and the utility user um, the requests. So to make sure we um, differentiate both, for the data owner, we're gonna use an Exos token starting with B. Exos token is like the standard um, credential that the user needs to show a service before it, to call its API. So the data owner Exos token is gonna to start with B and the user utility gonna have an Exos token starting with C. Okay, so let's move to the demo. Here is the Firefox plugin. Before we start, um, I'll just show you how the data looks like. So I thought that instead of showing like average of numbers, it would be nicer to do this on um, pictures. So this is the data owner. As evident here, you can see that the, um, the Excel token starts with B. We're doing a GET request. This is how a GET request looks in Swift. Uh, we're going to look at um, a Dragonfly picture um, that is in my objects container. So let's run this query. And we've got this nice, oops, how do we share it? This nice creature here. So we want to protect this nice creature's identity. And so we wouldn't let the utility user to access it seeing the face. So let's try and, and do a get request use, um, by the utility user. So here's the request, it, it is a get, it's to the same place, but here, as you can see, the Excel token starts with C. So this is done on behalf of the utility user. Um, let's do a send here and forbidden. Let's now try also to add the header of Xrun Stolet. We're now um, trying to do the same get with the extra header that says to, the store, to, this, to Swift, run the blurring storage there. Let's try that. Oops. Yeah, okay, it worked because, what, okay, it worked because I, I forgot to delete um, the, uh, the credentials. So here it is once the storage is executed. Okay, what I didn't show was um, this request here. This request is the request that needs to be run by the data owner so that the utility user would get access. So this is a post request targeted at the container in Swift ACLs are done on the container level rather than for each object. And we can see here that, okay, so this is um, the data owner request. By this header, it says, give the utility user a, a, a read via storlet, and the storlet needs to be the blur storlet one, okay? So this was done beforehand, and this is why we saw that we can succeed with the storlet. All right, so this was um, the data privacy use case. Um, present mode, one second. And now I move to what I call the cheap bakers use case. So the idea behind the cheap bakers use case is that for some workloads, it might be more uh, beneficial in terms of price to, to invest in more CPU on the storage size, side rather than to copy the data to the compute side. 
um, I've tried to develop a pricing model, a concrete pricing model that can help decide for a certain workload whether it would be uh, more beneficial to run it on the, to, to add more CPU to the storage side rather than moving across the network. It's very initial. I would love to get feedback on that. I, I, have, I already have some improvements that I need to put there in. Um, it's really initial. Next use case is what I call the super user use case. So in the super user use case, a deployer might want to add some functionality through storage to the base system. Why would you want to do that? Maybe it's a proprietary functionality. Maybe it's something that cannot go upstream for any reason, so we can do this via storage, right? Um, there is a European project called IOSTAC um, that we've been working with. Um, the IOSTAC project actually took this idea one step further. So not only did they add like, more functionality via storage, they also add a layer of policy there that can give you different SLAs to different users, while, so, so certain user would be able to use that, that type of functionality and other this kind of functionality. And this is going to be presented later on today in quarter two, three o'clock um, in the V Brown break session, V, v Brown back sessions. Um, okay, some short history and status of the project. So it was first opened uh, by IBM in August 2015. Then from December to June 2016, um, Koda and Takashi from NTT Group did a, a major refactoring work um, and became core members of the project. Uh, they also added unit testing that was missing. Then in July, we've added new documentation. We've added functionality so that storage can create new objects from existing objects. Uh, we've done a lot of work around Spark integration. In August, we've added various, uh, various additional functionalities um, written here. I won't go over it. And then we approached the, the OpenStack TC to become uh, part of the big tent. Uh, they're really positive about it. We, do, we, we were given some homework and a mentor. We did pretty much most of the work. Um, and we'll approach them again once we're, once we're done. And we have a stable Newton release. Questions? Koda. <laughs> Okay, thanks Sarah, for the great session. So, uh, um, uh, one question for the uh, security uh, demos. So, you had uh, uh, some, looks like the custom middleware to enable the uh, default learning strides, right? So, so, if so you were asking whether the stolet also does the face recognition? Or just the yeah, bearing? Yeah, Is yeah, that? yeah. Okay. So, okay, it's a good question. <laughs> so, um, the, I, had, I had face locations as a metadata. Mm -hmm. You can think of it that there is another storelet that does metadata extraction, metadata enrichment. Mm -hmm. So that when you upload the, you, you actually do a put with Xran storelet. We, we implemented this before in other uh, demos. Um, so this, um, this toilet would identify the, um, the face. I didn't run it on insects, though. <laughs> um, it would run it, it would enrich the Swift metadata, and the toilet that I actually uh, ran already looks at this metadata and does the blurring. So just the blurring. All right. Thank you. Oh, by the way, it is done with OpenCV. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess not. Okay, so thank you very much.